Well, welcome everyone. Great to see you. I'm Andy um, and it's my joy and privilege to be leading place at the table today and interviewing our amazing guest, Barbara Henderson, um, a children's author based in Inverness. Um, now, I only met Barbara a couple of weeks ago on Zoom just to, to, to get to know her better, but we're going to be hearing a story slightly different from the ones we've heard in the past. We've been thinking perhaps of people from different ethnic backgrounds and focusing a, a lot on on the, the race aspects, but we're going to hear from Barbara, who's uh, originally from Germany, uh, but is now um, here in Scotland. And uh, she's recently written a book uh, on the whole um, post-Brexit and identity and uh, conversation. And so it's going to be really helpful in our discussion. Mary was just saying what Place at a Table is. So it's a conversation that was started really in light of the George Floyd murder in America. And Duncan and the team at uh, Edinburgh City Mission really wanted to have a, a safe place for conversations where we can listen and learn uh, from people from different uh, ethnic backgrounds, social backgrounds, in order that we can be uh, more effective Christians in our, in our witness and in our worship. And so uh, it's with that in view that we, we can begin and pray that this time will be really enriching and edifying for us as Christians. Well, Barbara, great to have you with us. And uh, why don't we just kick off just why don't you give us like some of the headlines So tell us about yourself, uh, family, your work, and then we'll dig deeper into your story in just a minute. Absolutely. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm brilliant to be here. Thank you so much for asking me to come on. Uh, my name is Barbara Henderson. Um, my maiden name was Haas. I'm a German by birth and I grew up in Germany with no um, sort of ancestry in this country at all. Um, but uh, I came over to study and, uh, you know, there's a bit of a story in that and I might, uh, you know, go into that a little bit about the arrival here and what actually prompted me to move from my homeland to Scotland. And um, I'm very happy to tell you all of that. Uh, I graduated uh, a few years later, got married to a Scot, uh, Rob, and, um, you know, trained to be a teacher. All of that happened in Edinburgh. And um, in fact, at that point, I met uh, Duncan Cuffell from the Edinburgh City Mission, who was uh, attending the same church as we were at the time. And then, um, you know, life took us all over the place with work. I uh, became an English and drama teacher, worked in secondary schools and then laterally in primary schools. But um, sort of alongside all of that, I had always had a bit of an interest in writing. And I pursued that a little bit more when we had our three children. I had some time at home looking after them and uh, you know it felt like that was an opportunity to explore that side of things so I um, was lucky enough after a few years of um, you know having a go to be picked up by a publisher and uh, I've had uh, six children's novels out with Cranach and Publishing um, most of them historical and about Scotland history ironically not even being Scottish myself and then um, I, I sort of uh, had this idea just in response to the whole uh, Brexit debate and uh, everything that was going on uh, politically really, um, to pitch a book about people who had come from elsewhere in Europe and who'd made a positive difference to Scotland. So I pitched the book um, and the, my publishers are children's publishers. So it was a different publisher who showed an interest in, uh, in that idea. And um, actually as lockdown struck, it was an incredibly helpful thing to be able to, you know, all my school events as an author in schools sort of dried up and came to nothing. And, um, you know, schools weren't open and they certainly weren't allowed to have visitors in and they absolutely had no money to pay those, those visitors if they did. So I, um, I ended up just throwing myself into writing this book. And uh, the result is uh, Scottish by Inclination, which you may or may not have seen in a Waterstones near you or whatever. Um, and uh, it's a collection of uh, other people, interviews with other people from elsewhere around the EU. Every EU country is represented in this. Um, but actually the publishers wanted me to tell my own story, my own kind of, you know, I guess journey to Scotland and journey in Scotland uh, as part of it. And um, even though it's not an overtly Christian book or a, a Christian publisher, um, you know, I felt that, you know, to give a sense of myself that needed to be in there. And uh, I'm certainly not hiding that aspect. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, why I'm here. So I now live in Inverness, 
teach drama very part time now, and uh, I'm devoting the rest of my time to writing and uh, trying to have a go at that and see how that goes. So I've got another another children's book out in three weeks. So I'm building up at the moment, lots of promotion work and what have you. So um, that's that's it. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, um, just as you were touching there upon your book and upon your own story, it'd be great to hear about, um, so you've, you've told us that you, you were born in Germany. It'd be good to hear about being a German and then transitioning and coming into uh, Scotland and the Scottish culture. And uh, even as you're, you're speaking about that, it'd be great to hear of the, the, the Christian influence. I know you spoke about um, mm. how Christians were, were in many ways those who welcomed you when you arrived here. So Please yeah, ab absolutely. So I was already a, a Christian by the time that I chose to come to uh, to Scotland. And I think, you know, just to give you that sense, I mean, I, I had loved English at school, but very much in Germany, it was a foreign language degree with a little bit of literature thrown in. And the thing that really floated my boat, and now I know why, obviously, is literature. And I thought I would love to study English in a country where it isn't a language degree, where it's a, a literature degree, essentially. Um, so I had done some work experience in uh, Blackpool, of all places, where um, my brother-in-law, my sister, had, uh, you know, rogue, married somebody from Blackpool, very much an upsetting thing to a German family like mine, you know, <laughs> what is going on? Um, so, uh, but anyway, he had a host of useful connections and, um, you know, in Blackpool, um, there was a lot of seasonal work. So he said, you know, you could go over, stay with some of my friends, pay, pay them some rent and uh, you can improve your English and um, you know do a bit of work so I waitressed in Blackpool and I remember wrestling with this I had a year of school left I needed to apply somewhere to go to university and my parents of course were totally expecting me to choose a German university and I remember I vividly remember praying God if there is any way that I could come over here show me give me some kind of sign that's a big decision I don't want to make that by myself and um I was cleaning the tables and I think it literally was either that day or the next day. It was incredibly close. And um, so the restaurant had emptied out. It was one of these fish and chips and uh, et cetera type of cafes. And um, there was a lady sitting by herself and she sort of struck up a conversation as guests normally did. Um, so she was asking me where I was from and I explained that I was from Germany. Uh, and then she said, so, you know, are you still at school? I said, oh, leaving in a year or so. Uh, and she said, are you thinking about what to do after? And I said, yes, so I am, yeah, as a matter of fact. And so far, so normal. And then um, she said, are you going to study here or in Germany? And I was like, oh, my word, that's a weird question. Um, so, and it sort of alerted me. And I said, well, uh, I don't know yet. I'm uh, just considering my options. Uh, she says, if you were to come here, would you know what to do? And I was like, I would not. Uh, she says, it's actually my job to advise school leavers on which universities to choose. So why don't you swing by my office, which is just around that block? And, um, you know, I'll I'll see to it. And I, I went home with a, a bike load. I remember bags hanging from both handlebars and um, with prospectuses, which at the time were physical objects and, uh, you know, really heavy. And I sort of, I just really felt that God gave me a sign of that road is open to you, that that possibility is open to you and then I thought well I'm never going to be able to afford the fees and I did a bit of researching and it turned out that the EU had made the decision in that year and only in that year that I was going to go to university so for the forthcoming year they were going to start funding all full degrees for EU uh, citizens moving between countries so I was a test case in, in a sense, you know, um, the, the only proof I had of this agreement was an insert into some like a little paper, recycled paper insert into the prospectus of, of German student funding. And uh, I literally went and waved this in front of the faces of the people in Edinburgh and they went, oh, looks like that's culture. And yes, I guess you can study here without paying any fees. So in many ways, the EU kind of made my stay here possible, uh, my studying here possible, and so on. Uh, so yeah, but I, I felt God led me here. And, um, you know, I went to Greenbelt Christian kind of music cult culture arts festival um, the summer before I went to uni. And uh, there was a stall there from UCCF. And uh, they basically said, if you're going to a British university after this summer, put your name down and uh, your contact details and, um, you know, We'll see if we can link you up with somebody. And I did that. And actually, I totally forgot about it. 
And when I arrived in Edinburgh, which I'll read you a tiny little bit um, in a minute from the book, but uh, on my, on my um, like under the door of my room, there was a letter, there was a physical letter from a girl who was in the Christian Union. And um, she literally must have been past my name from, um, you know, from UCCF. And, uh, you know, I told her I was staying in Pollock and she must have literally delivered this thing to the office there. And they might have put it under the room where I was staying. Uh, but there was a physical letter there. It was five pages long. And, uh, you know, small pages, but it was like, you know, hi, I'm Judy, I'm a medical student, I'm in fourth year, you know, I go to the CU, we meet here and here, and these are some of the things we've got on in Fresh this week, and, you know, uh, we would so love to meet you and, and welcome you, and please ask for me when you get there, and I would love to meet you in person, and it was this whole thing about my favourite cafe in Edinburgh is, and um, it was so lovely to have a starting point. Like, I can't tell you what that letter meant to me at the time. And it was probably something that might have taken her 20 minutes, half an hour to do. Um, you know, and I still, I have no idea where she is now. I have no idea what she's doing, but it was, it was just an incredible witness to me. Um, and then I just remember, I, I prayed for two things as I arrived. I prayed that God would lead me to Christians. And I prayed that um, he would give me an early opportunity to say to my flatmates that I was a Christian just to put the marker down and to let them be in no doubt about who I was, because I knew that long term that would make life a lot easier for me. Um, you know, if I was pretending to be someone I wasn't, then, you know, all sorts of stuff would be thrown into my way that I probably wouldn't know how to handle. And I wanted to be clear right from the off. And actually, I got both. I got um, the first time I walked around the university campus, there was a Christian Union outreach, and I literally sort of threw myself at them. And then, um, the other uh, thing that happened was that my two flatmates, when they arrived, started making fun of the Gideon Bibles um, that were in the halls of residence and they were like chucking them around and, you know, going, oh, what are we going to use these for? You know, door stopper, what do you reckon? You know, toilet paper. And I just remember thinking, you know, I'm a Christian. I might actually read mine. I do read my Bible. And, and that was it. You know, it shut them up at the time. But, you know, and it was a, there was a little awkward kind of moment. But um you know it, it really helped me to settle in and then I was relatively quick to just decide on a church and and to try and get stuck into the CU and uh, you know while it's not great to just be in that Christian bubble I think it made a, a world of difference to you know how how I was able to maybe grow in my student years so yeah I mean Christians putting themselves out is basically you know the, the bottom line when I first came over, I knew nobody in Scotland, of course, and, uh, you know, I had my flight and it took me to Glasgow. There weren't at the time flights to Edinburgh from anywhere near where I lived in Germany. And um, so it was literally a, a sort of church friend of a church friend of a church friend knew somebody in Glasgow and they passed that message on. And, and you know, this guy had agreed to pick me up at the airport, take me home to his parents' house. They were going to look after me for a night and then drive me across to Edinburgh, like, people I'd never met in my life, you know, uh, uh, and that's just really powerful to me mm. that Christians will do that for each other and that, um, you know, as Christians, we should be willing to do that for anybody, maybe not just our brothers and, Christ uh, and sisters in Christ. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. That's a beautiful testimony of just, you know, the impact and then the, the, the Christian love and welcome can have to a stranger in a foreign land. So one of the things I remember you mentioned uh, in our first conversation was, uh, some of the chat, just small challenges that you faced as you come in. Do you want to, yeah, speak to them and just give us a flavor? Yeah, of some of oh my goodness, yeah. I mean, you know, I thought, for example, that my English was brilliant. You know, I'd got, um, in, in Germany, you get in your Abitur, which is the sort of final exams that you do. You know, I literally got full marks in my English um, exam. I thought I was some sort of genius, you know what I mean? So I rock up here and the guy who does all the kind of moderating and talking for the CU from the front is a wee Glaswegian. We used to call him uh, wee Pete. I literally had no idea what he was saying, like ever. You know, I'm not sure that I got, even after four years in Scotland, I don't think I had the faintest idea what this man said to me half the time. And then, um, you know, it just really, he'd open his mouth and sounds came out and people laughed in places. And I was like, what on earth? I just, you know, I, I thought I was speaking the same language. But so that was the big talent. I just had not anticipated. Um, the other thing was that, you know, the sense of humor works quite differently. Like, you know, famously, everybody thinks Germans don't have a sense of humor. Um, 
I don't think that's completely true, but I think it certainly was a bit different from, um, you know, what was happening here, the, the banter that, uh, you know, where people basically, you know, slug each other off and the fonder they are of each other, the more nasty they will become to each other. And, um, you know, uh, I'm not saying all Germans are really literal, but maybe that was a little bit the case with me that I just like, why are these people so horrible to me? What's going on, you know? Um, why would they lay into me constantly, you know? And I remember my Irish pal taking me aside and going, Barbara, you know, it's because they like you, that's why, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it's just, it's little things like that. But actually there's, you know, such a richness. I remember one night when we went um, camping with a whole load of friends and we sort of sat around the campfire and uh, we had a, literally, we spent an evening talking about what noises animals made in different countries. And, uh, you know, I was like, how could you do That's just ludicrous. It's just not what it is. You know, it's really key. And they were like on the floor and it's, it's just so funny. Um, to, to see these little small things. There are times when you feel out of it. I remember another evening where everybody seemed to sort of go off on one on the, um, uh, I don't know, the theme tunes of children's TV. You know, oh, do you remember the theme tune? Do you remember that program? And they would like hum the tune and everybody go, yeah, I remember this. And I was like, I don't want to, because I did not watch that because it's totally different cultural heritage. And that's the whole gap in what I know about. Um, so yeah, small, 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 small things, you know, food, um, you know, is, is different, obviously. Um, and, uh, but, but really the smallest things can sometimes kind of set you off. For me, the things that were difficult um, was when, um, you know, things were happening at home, like my dad took on well, uh, or my sister had a baby and I wasn't there, you know. And in those days, there were no cheap numbers to call, you know, there was basically no internet, um, you know, this was the the early 90s, you know, um, no, no one had a mobile phone and you just really didn't feel part of it. You felt utterly out of it. And, um, mm. you know, that was a little bit when you didn't feel 100 percent in in the place yeah. where you were, but you felt 100 percent out of the place that you used to belong to. Mm. Um, that can be a tricky place to be. But mm. I just do a little reading Please. about arriving. So the chapters are quite short in this, um, but the plan is maybe to uh, to read two shortage chapters. And uh, like you see, so this is from uh, the book. This is actually chapter one. It's called Arrival. You'll recognize them. He's really tall, Louis said. I raised my eyebrows. He'll be there, don't worry. I was still unconvinced. How will I recognize him if I've never even met him? Do you have a photo? My friend Louis shook his head and giggled as if suddenly struck by a thought of pure genius. Look, it's called Fergus McNeil, right? And when we worked together in London, he used to really like this song, Celebration by Kool and the Gang. That'll be your signal. What? To me, an uninitiated German about to move to Scotland for the duration of my degree, Louis was the nearest thing to a native, a Londoner, albeit dobbing in Germany, but with a host of useful connections. One of these, his friend, Fergus, was to pick me up from Glasgow Airport, drop me at his parents' house overnight and see me onto some sort of transport to Edinburgh the morning after. Simple and straightforward, but this was Louis. Sing the song, he said. That way he'll definitely know it's you. Louis winked. I decided to leave it. After all, I didn't want him to think that the wind-up was working. Barely a week later, I'd done the necessary. Guitar and gargantuan backpack stored in the plane's hold, I sat in my seat on the edge of the atmosphere and cried. I cried for the parents I'd left behind, for my sister about to give birth, for the enormity of my decision and for the country disappearing under clouds beneath me, which, which would be no longer my home as soon as I touched down on Scotland's rain-soaked asphalt. It was dusk. The businessman beside me pushed his way into the queue. In fact, everyone who had lazed and dozed their way through the flight was suddenly in a rush, except me. Like the landing jolt, it struck me. I wasn't just scared of going. I was scared of arriving. What had possessed me to want to do this? Guitar and backpack reclaimed, I shuffled through the exit gate. For all these complete strangers knew, I was naturally puffy-faced and red-nosed. And I had more important things to worry about anyway, finding Fergus. I scanned the crowd already thinning with greetings and departures. 
A couple of men were tall, I guessed. I sauntered past them both, neither of them paid me the slightest bit of attention. Waiting alone in an arrivals lounge late at night in a strange country, I began to panic until it struck me. Oh, stroke of genius, Louis, very funny. He's primed Fergus not to declare himself until... I took a deep breath, so be it. Picking my guitar up, I sauntered past the first tall man who sat down by now, humming with ever-increasing volume as I passed. He looked up, but not with recognition, with something else I'd rather not think about. I decided to give the other man a try, even though he was now hugging an elderly woman who'd been on the plane behind me, singing timidly now, celebration. I'm ashamed to admit I even sang the guitar riff that followed. Both men disappeared down the emptying arrivals lounge, but come to think of it, Louis was small. Maybe to him, almost anyone would be tall. Nothing for it. Celebration. By the time I heard loud footsteps echoing, I was pretty much singing out all my desperation at top volume. A ridiculously tall young man ran into the hall, where by now only a few people milled around, most of them cleaners, and a singing German student. He'd gone to the wrong gate by mistake. Almost 30 years later, this country has now become my country. I've arrived. And if you recall a very odd time at Glasgow Airport when a dishevelled teenager spontaneously burst into song, maybe now you understand. Uh, every word of that is true, by the way. I really did sing, uh, sing the song because I thought it was a gigantic wake up, a uh, wind up from my friend Louis. So, uh, that, yeah, that's it excellent. Kind of, <laughs> it's, it's just, that's the opening of it. And I think it gives you a flavour. It's kind of little snippety bits um, from the book. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much. And I look forward to the next read. And, and I, I suppose we could, in some ways, transition to it. Yeah. Um, because, so the book, why don't you tell us the inspiration for the book and just a, a bit about it, but then uh, that would m maybe lead us on to your reading. Into the next reading. The okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I really felt that uh, during the whole kind of debate about, um, you know, the Brexit referendum and so on, that the case for... EU immigration wasn't made brilliantly you know it felt like uh, kind of oh yeah we have to take this thing called immigration um you know and that'll just be one of the, the sort of hits we have to take for the economic benefits that the EU gives you know it felt like that was kind of the narrative we benefit from the EU but we have to kind of take take you know a bit of immigration our way um you know to sort of you know offset that that's what i felt and i felt that what was not there was making the case for all these amazing people um and obviously it's a narrow focus you know i think immigration in general from anywhere benefits a country makes us richer makes us um more varied expands our horizons you know makes us more compassionate and empathetic and tolerant and all of those things are true I think but uh yeah I just felt like for the EU in particular that was missing and um so I had pitched um I don't know something like um you know academics removal men you know kind of listed a few jobs um and basically said you know the um the benefits of EU immigration uh Scottish by inclination and I pitched it as a non-fiction adult book and uh, a couple of publishers came to me and then said um, the ones that took it on as a as a project, they said this is this is fundable. So we've got a pandemic going. You're not making any money with your other uh, writing at the moment. You're not doing events. You know, apply for funding to write this book. It's very topical, and I think you can do this. And I did actually. I managed to get some funding from Creative Scotland to to write it. Um, but yeah, then they said, you know, rather than having a sort of little collection of oh here's somebody from Lithuania here is somebody from France here's somebody from Liechtenstein you know what I mean um why not kind of bookend it I suppose with your own life um so that there is a story and I actually said absolutely not and walked away because I had no intention ever of of writing a memoir or anything even approaching it you know, I had it in my head that I would have to, you know, compromise privacy for people I care about, that I would have to, um, you know, say nasty things about people or whatever, you know. And actually, the more I thought about it, it's about me and it's about Scotland. It's about that relationship. So, you know, actually what I put in and what doesn't make it in is entirely in my hands. And my husband's quite a private guy. So, you know, I basically 
everything I wrote, I showed to him first. You know, I couldn't not mention him. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I didn't go heavy on that whole side of things, you know. And, um, you know, if people would like to know that, then, you know, sorry, that's not on offer. <laughs> you know, I'll I'll tell you about me and about Scotland. And, uh, and that's what's, what is on offer. And I sent it to the publishers and they actually really liked it. They, they felt like it was quite a good way. So it's just snippets. It's not an, a comprehensive account of my life. It's just snippets of uh, experiences that I felt were relevant. So perhaps one of the um, experiences that is relevant is the chapter on the Brexit referendum. So yeah. if you can bear it, will I read it? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, OK, I'm getting to the age where glasses are helpful. Sorry, guys. So um, the Brexit referendum. The June morning sun swirled through the glass. I fumbled to switch off my alarm and blinked hard before swinging myself out of bed. As the only early riser in our family, and even that label is worn a little half-heartedly, I staggered downstairs and clipped the dog on the lead. The morning dog walks are mine, generally. In the evening, I wilt like a daisy and the thought of heading out into the inevitable lashing rain fills me with dread. No, I'd rather take the morning hit. There are a variety of routes around our neighbourhood in Inverness. It becomes an autopilot exercise, except for that morning. Hello, shouted the man from two streets along. Big day today, huh? My brain was still doing its morning stretches. What? What big day? Brexit? He shook his head. He was a fellow German, a forester, who'd lived here almost as long as I had. His wife had taken their child to our German group years ago. Aren't you worried? He wanted to know. Why would I be worried? I didn't think I knew a single person who supported Brexit, and surely Nigel Farage by himself couldn't win a referendum. No, not worried, I declared blithely. Ah, he said with his trademark smile, I'm not so sure. I walked home more slowly than I'd set out. Really? Was it even remotely possible that this country would vote to come out of Europe? The pictures of endless lines of Eastern Europeans queuing up to get into Britain had been discredited. The 300 million a week for the NHS claim had been a fabrication of the Leave campaign. No, I thought, people can see through this. And yet. I watched Indonesians stand in line outside the polling station at the end of our road, but I didn't join them. As a European citizen, I had no right to vote in a UK referendum. That in itself was unsettling. As EU citizens here, we were the ones whose lives would be most drastically affected, and yet on this issue, we were silenced. I had no voice in the decision the country would make that day. I valued the institution immensely. The EU had made free movement possible for people like me, enabling us to work, live, study wherever we chose. Now I had to trust those around me to value it too, and I did. In the run-up to the day, it was hard not to take some of the debate personally. Several acquaintances had expressed surprise that this referendum had anything to do with me. We don't mean you, obviously, not people like you. People like me, who'd lived and worked here, claimed no benefits, contributed to society by volunteering and looking after their local communities. Well, that was a little rich. The point was, if we left the EU, people like me would not be able to come in the first place. Of course, I recognised that not every person who supported Brexit had a personal vendetta against immigrants, but in the rhetoric, it did feel like a driving factor. In the evening, there was a real sense of occasion on the BBC. Polls have now closed for the referendum on British membership of the European Union announced David Dimbleby, the veteran journalist who entertainingly once had to miss question time because he had been knocked unconscious by a bull on his Sussex arm. We expect the first results to come in at midnight. Rob and I exchanged a glance across the sofa. Are we staying up? I asked. Rob hesitated. It was a Thursday, a school night. He'd have work the next morning. Or a bit, he mumbled. The unspoken words hung in the air. We'll watch until we're sure that there's nothing to worry about. We'll soon see how it's going. We brewed some strong coffee, gently coaxed the teenagers upstairs and made ourselves comfortable. I brought a duvet down from the bedroom. There was much speculation. Interviews with focus groups and interested commentators only part held our interest. 
The footage of students sprinting across sports halls with ballot boxes, that was more like it. It felt like a Hollywood blockbuster and hopefully one which was going to finish with a satisfying outcome. We expect it to be safe in a roller coaster sort of way. You take your seat, you strap in. For a moment, the illusion of deadly danger sends your heart rate soaring, but you're never in danger, not really. We began to shift uncomfortably as result after result was shared. True to my expectations, Scotland voted comfortably to stay within the European Union, but it was a different story in England. At around one o'clock, Rob decided to go to bed. I can't watch anymore, he said. I stretched myself out on my own and wrapped the duvet tightly around me for comfort as I saw the world that I knew crumble. Had I ever known this country at all? Who were these people who wanted to stop immigration at all costs? Who around me had been in on this plan? I drifted in and out of the nightmare. At 4.40 a.m. on the 24th of June 2016, a tired-looking David Dimbleby announced, the British people have spoken and the answer is, we're out. I woke Rob to let him know. A couple more hours of sleep were wishful thinking. The days which followed were a strange blur, a hangover of scrambled thoughts and tearfulness. I was mortified to find myself crying on an elevator in the local shopping centre. Who of you voted for this? I wondered as I looked across the throng of shoppers. We don't mean you, not people like you. It's not personal. From where I was standing, the decision felt very personal indeed. Well, thank you. On the back of that. It's quite, a, it's quite a change in atmosphere. And, and you know, that was one of my struggles with the book. You know, there, there are lots of, I don't know, what I would consider my sort of dinner party stories, you know, funny experiences, uh, cultural misunderstandings, you know, the kind of stuff that you can have a giggle at and move on. Um, but I felt I'd be lying if I, if I quote this in the same way, because I think for a lot of us, um, and by that, I mean people, you know, who were of perhaps a European, um, you know, background, it did land like that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it sounds a bit overwrought and even melodramatic when I read it like that. But the truth is, it's absolutely how it felt. And that is, um, is very much what other people would echo to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my 30 interviewees, there, there was basically not one of them who, who said they didn't feel this. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, it's so helpful for you know for us who are, who are here listening and what des desirous to learn that this is how you know a decision like that made pe our neighbours feel and perhaps in many ways we were unaware and oblivious to, to what was actually going on. On the back of that, we had a we had a conversation at, at length about identity, mm. and so so why don't you just tell us about you know how does Barbara view yourself? Are you a German? Are you a Scot? Do you know, I, I very recently uh, applied for uh, British citizenship. So five years after the referendum, there was the, the kind of uh, cutoff. You know, if you hadn't applied for um, British citizenship, um, then you weren't going to be able to attain it again um, and still retain your German one. So it cost me over £3,000 to do this. So I think that's something really important to understand. It cost the British government £275-ish. 271, I think, uh, to actually process it, but they charge people a, a ludicrous amount of money. Um, and for me, that had been the only reason I hadn't actually pursued it yet. You know, for the first 10 years or so of being here, the Germans wouldn't let you be dual. So, you know, you were either German or you were not, and it was one or the other. So I wasn't up for that because I still had Asian parents on the continent, still have my mother there. So I wasn't going to give up my German identity because that is part of me. Um, but uh, and actually, Britain was my territory. We were all in the EU. I didn't feel like a foreigner. By the time I, I um, you know, had reached that point, I'd been in the, the country for 25 years. You know what I mean? Like I had totally forgotten I was a foreigner. It was it was just not part of my thinking anymore. You know, it was a, a sort of random little describing factor about me in the same way that you'd say she's got brown eyes or, or dark hair or whatever you know what I mean oh yeah and she's German and you know but actually I was very much I was in with the Brits and I think this whole Brexit debate just othered me and so many others again um so you know I feel that all of us uh, and I, I 
use that in the in the sort of um, you know end chapter of Scottish by inclination. I think you know we're all threads, aren't we? And we, we're many colours. It's not like German. That's your identity. You know, we're all multicolored, and uh, you know the whole them and us thinking like we are the Scots and they are the immigrants. You know, I think that can be quite an unhelpful. Um, sort of division to create artificially because even going one or two generations back we're all mixtures again you know what I mean um you know none of us have have really got the right to sort of hold up the flag and say well this is us and you're all the rest of them so I think the more we start thinking of everybody as people um and all of us you know are these beautiful mixtures that make up the warp and the weft of, of Scottish society do you know, uh, we strengthen the fabric, you know, and then you've got the odd ones that just go really bright and do something really amazing. And I, I was lucky to interview some of them in the book, um, you know, some of the immigrants who, who've made a monumental difference in some way or another uh, to Scottish society. And it was such an honour to speak to them. But many people just live their quiet lives in the way that many of, of the rest of us do. And, and all of us give the warp and the weft and the, the fabric its stability. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's, a, for me, a slightly more helpful way. I don't really, I try now to stay away from labels in, in the way that I would view my own identity. But there were many wrestles along the way. And, um, you know, I think largely because society does impose that on us. Um, you know, my part time this morning actually was about uh, looking after the aliens, which is uh, really interesting in the light of what we were doing today, talking about it. And, you um, in the, the commentary, it talked uh, about how we're all uh, pilgrims, you know, and it's actually, we're all wanderers. We're all um, guests, if you like, and we're on our journey with God. And, um, you know, it's interesting, the word apparently used, I didn't know this, is peregrines. Um, so like a falcon, you know, just always flying, always on the go. Um, and maybe not 100% in control, so maybe we need to just sort of go with it, you know, um, pilgrimage is whatever happens, and and you you need to sort of take it in that in that sense and not feel too settled. But it certainly made me reevaluate some of the political discourse, and uh, there was that little moment as well where you go, as a Christian, you know, should I be political, should I express an opinion? Um, mm. It's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I think you've landed there with some lessons that we, we can all take away and learn from. But I want to open up for questions for, for other people. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Barbara? I feel like I've been through like a mixture of emotions from the high and the laughing of part of your arrival to you know, just the serious weight and gravity of just coming to appreciate again, you know, what it made people feel post-Brexit. Um, Barbara, maybe just in, ter in terms of sort of um, overt prejudice, um, like over your 30 plus years in Scotland, have you, um, specifically in church, which I know is, makes it a bit more sensitive, but do you think, have you experienced anything or, or more subtle? <laughs> I think, um, you know, there is a sort of slight wariness um, you know, in general, and I'm not sure whether that's just, um, you know, my experience as somebody who was from a different country. Like, I remember when we uh, got married and um, somebody sort of made the comment, oh, uh, you need to think that one through. It's the first time that outsiders have got married in the church. And we're like, we've been here for four years. You know what I mean? Like, every week. <laughs> it's like, do you know what I mean? That was a, a bit of a sort of, oh, okay, there is that, you know, but I don't know whether that's just because you know, the church traditionally had been very small and, um, you know, certain families perhaps. And then all of a sudden there was this influx of students and, and you know, alongside uh, the rest of us. That was one thing. Um, in terms of, you know, actual kind of hostility, there was one moment and that was quite early on where an, a German friend was visiting me and we were speaking German on a bus. And an old lady came past us and sat um, and uh, said something about the war and got off the bus. And that was a bit of a kind of, oh my word, like literally this is a lady who looked like she might have been in her 70s, 80s and, uh, you know, who clearly had a really visceral reaction. But then I don't know what her experience was, what she'd lost. I don't know what the backstory was. So, um, but that's literally the only situation I can think of where I was discriminated against or where I felt 
you know, in that way targeted. Certainly at university, you know, there were some barriers. I was doing an English degree um, and, and there were challenges. The first thing that uh, these guys threw at us <laughs> was um, the Testament of Crusade by Henderson, which is a 13th century uh, Scottish poet. So, uh, it, you know, that was a challenge to get your head around 13th century Scots as somebody who had sat in high school and, uh, you know, learned English as a foreign language. And uh, also there was a fair bit of burns right at the beginning. So I, I just remember going, I've literally never heard of these people before. Like I'd never heard of Robert Burns. Like who is Robert Burns? And of course you guys here, you know, you go to school, you do your burns every single January. And um, you know, it was these kind of things that people take for granted that you would know about, um, you know, and, and you just don't, and you need to catch up. And I think that's often the case. Um, yeah, I also felt that maybe I had a slightly lucky escape because I got married to somebody called Henderson, so I sounded like I should belong. <laughs> and uh, as an English teacher, maybe that was helpful. Um, you know, if, if your children go to school and sit a higher English and, uh, you know, they say, oh, yeah, my, my teacher is a, a native German speaker, not, not a native English speaker, you know, maybe parents would have more um, of a reservation about that, whereas you know, for me, that was just never the issue. And uh, in fact, I was telling Andy in our introductory chat, I had this amazing lecturer who um, was just a, a really brilliant bloke. He um, used to run the linguistics department at Edinburgh University, but he was a German as well. And I remember kind of getting some documentation signed off towards the end of my degree. And he said, so what's the plan? And I said, well, I had considered teaching if I was going to go back to Germany, but actually now I'm not sure that I can because, you know, I'm staying here and, you know, I'm a German. I can't really teach English, can I? And I just remember him looking at me like as if I'd come from Mars and then said, why not? Why ever not? And I remember him saying that in front of all his colleagues and it just landed um, and became actually a tiny little bit of a mantra for me. Like, I don't know if this guy's a Christian. In fact, you know, I'm certainly not aware of it. But um, I suppose to always ask yourself that question when something's a bit scary or is maybe not the done thing, you know, why not? Why ever not? It's, it's quite a useful sort of litmus test whether something's worth doing or, um, you know, whether you could maybe pursue something that you just want to rule out out of fear. Um, uh, that was that was a helpful experience for me mm. but no in, in terms of um, hostility in the church probably not really but that sentence that I was reading about you know we don't mean you obviously not people like you that was a direct quote from a couple in church yeah um, so it wasn't meant to be discriminatory I think they were trying to say to me that they appreciated me and didn't think of me as a foreigner but they didn't appreciate that um, do you know the the political decision that was made would actually make my life as it has been impossible like nobody will now be able to do what I did and that kind of makes me sad because I'm thinking what are we going to miss out on and not, not that I'm some kind of amazing you know asset to Scotland or whatever but you know I think that there are people you know interviewed in the book and elsewhere who are amazing assets and if we put these stumbling blocks into their ways to coming, you know, the people who are missing out are us. Um, yeah, so just, I suppose if, if I was to say, you know, as Christians, what can we do? What's our kind of takeaway lesson here? How can we um, be welcoming the strangers? You know, I, I think the first thing is, you know, the Bible's full of these, um, you know, welcome the strangers because you were strangers in Egypt. Remember what that felt like, you know, uh, and and there's an awful lot of that. So I suppose stop thinking of ourselves as others. You know what I mean? Like you are the other. We are the real thing. Um, you know that would be helpful. And I think just the smallest little thing. I think often, um, you know, the the gestures that meant the most to me, um, you know, were small gestures like that letter, for example, or somebody saying, "Yeah, we'll pick you up from the airport and put you up overnight." I never had contact with these people again, ever. You know what I mean? Um, Fergus McNeil, I tracked him down recently, actually. It's so amazing. But uh, he's, he's a sociology lecturer 
as uh, as Glasgow Uni now or is it Strathclyde? Um, but yeah, amazing to think that these people are still out there. But it was such a small thing. Like I had to literally remind them that this happened, you know, because it was such a small thing to him. And to me, like I'm writing a book about it 30 years later. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, you know, when, when, when people first come, there is that vulnerable place. And if you make them feel wanted and treat them just like people, um that that can have a huge impact and um you know certainly was a massive massive witness to me that's excellent thank you so much any other questions uh, yeah, Mama, i was wondering um what sorry yeah that the chapter about the better referendum was really helpful to paint the picture of what it what it felt like at that time i was wondering what how it feels Kind of at this point, a few years on, yeah, what's kind of the, yeah, how does it yeah, feel? there is a, a sort of, I mean, it was raw at that point, I've got to be honest, like it, we, we all felt it, you know, there was a raw sense of disappointment and possibly disillusionment and so on. Now, um, you know, I think there is more of a, a sort of dull sense of regret that, you know, it didn't go the way that uh, we wanted and that actually the world we live in is possibly, maybe it's opened up our eyes a little bit to to the views that are around but I think you know it's it's so much wider than just people having an opinion on whether immigration is a good or not not a good thing you know it's it's the polarizing effect of the way that social media algorithms work that your own viewpoint is enforced continually uh, by the images and the content that you're shown it's about um you know people being able to find online uh, people who already think like them and then have their own opinions reinforced and it's about actually a, a failure i think you know to really make the case a positive case for why it was a great thing uh, to be part of the eu and i'm not saying that it didn't have its drawbacks too i know lots of people who voted to come out of europe you know and i i would not say that you know i'm still brilliant friends with some of them um so but there is a a sort of sense of you know maybe a waking up to the kind of world that we live in and uh, and a resolve to try and be more internationalist in my own outlook as a result um to try and counterbalance that you know um i mean for me as i say pragmatically i had to become a, a citizen here because i felt that that was the only way i was going to guarantee anything um, because I thought that there was nothing to worry about and I, I clearly predicted it entirely wrong. Um, so, you know, now I've got two nationalities and uh, I'm, I'm probably safe enough. But I just think there's a lot of people who are at the stage that I was at maybe 20 years ago, you know, who've not kind of got, you know, a, a marriage or a job or whatever here and who are much more, um, you know, up in the air about it. So, yeah, it does open your eyes to that. Um, yeah, lots of things are harder, you know, sending, I've sent probably about seven or eight letters and cards to Germany since, um, you know, the beginning of the year. And uh, I think two of them arrived. Um, all the others had to, you know, people have to pay extra. It's ridiculously expensive now to send anything abroad. So birthdays and mm -hmm. Christmas presents now cannot be sent by post, basically. Um, and ordering anything from Germany is pointless because I will never get it or have to pay 20 quid on top of it. Um, so there are, it's a changing world and, and it's not advantageous. And I do think that that's kind of being borne out. Um, but, you know, I appreciate, you know, people view things differently. It's just how it feels for me right now. It's, it, there's an, a sense of sadness about it. Also having, for example, my whole family going to one passport queue and all of a sudden, I have to go to the other. You know what I mean? That's that's weird. <laughs> that was never the case before. And um, it, yeah, it's a small, small thing, but it does make you feel it. You know, there is a physical impact. Like they sort of straight through and I have to explain myself. You know, I am quizzed whether I've got settled status or, you know, and so on. Um, yeah, it's just that sense of, of othering. Mm. Sorry, does that actually answer your question? I feel like I've rambled slightly. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Any other questions? If not, I'll pass back on to Mary. But thank you so much, Barbara. No, it was really great Truly. and lovely to to speak with you all. Thank you so much for listening. Yes, thank you so much, Barbara. 
hopefully my internet's okay <laughs> and um thank you as well Andy for hosting that for us that was really helpful um yeah I just I find it such an interesting conversation just being from Northern Ireland myself and the discussion around it was even so different in Northern Ireland than it is in Scotland than it was in England than it was in Wales like even between the four nations of the UK there are different discussions so it's always so interesting to hear the different points of view and what we can learn from that so thank you so much and um, I'm just gonna draw us to a close now um, and thank you everybody for joining us thank you for listening and um, just to announce that the next event the next place at the table is planned for Friday the 24th of June at 1 p.m and we're still to confirm a guest speaker for that but if you keep an eye out on our social media feeds, um, that'll be coming shortly. And um, yes, thank you again so much to everyone for joining us. And I hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you, everyone.